I'm Jan Worm and we're in my studio in Berkeley right now and I'm very happy that Wendy Martin is here with me today and that we'll be having a conversation about art, life, the creative life, mm -hmm. um, women in contemporary society and anything else that crosses our minds and our, um, our day today. Yeah. So glad to be here, very glad to be in this studio and surrounded by your work, Jan. It's fascinating. Everywhere I look, I see something really wonderful to think about and ask questions about and so forth. So we can, um, maybe you could even begin by um, talking a little bit about um, your art in general. I mean, it's got a very distinctive style. The first time I saw it, and I think everybody would agree, you'd say when you see one of your paintings, that's a Jan Worm. That's, that's, that's one of Jan's paintings. And what is it, do you think, that gives it such a um, unmistakable character? Uh, I mean, I, you know, I can see certain things. I see a kind of angularity and, and a certain kind of elongation and... Um, you know, your, your figures are, they're, they're not, I mean, they're distorted clearly, but in ways that are very, um, um, I said angular, but they're, they're, um, almost exp expressionist. I, I would like you to talk a little bit about it mm -hmm. and how you evolve this style. Did you always paint this way? Did you kind of <laughs> spring from the room painting like this or how, how did that happen? It's going back and covering a lot of territory and a lot of years of working. And um, that in some ways, um, we, we have an, an early impulse that is formed and that then um, pushes us in certain directions. And we're either working with that impulse or we counter it one way or the other. We're going back and forth. So I think for, um, for many artists who start out as children. Mm -hmm. There is an interest in taking the visual world and somehow holding on to it. Things that we're experiencing, things that we're seeing, things that we are imagining and wanting to give them form. And so um, all of that initially comes from our environment and things that we're looking at and seeing. Everything from the illustrations in children's books or fairy tales we mm -hmm. might be seeing to what's hanging on the walls in our homes or if we're taken into other environments it could be a grandparents house or into a museum or um, somewhere that's that's totally different and unfamiliar to us and those things all feed into those early images that we are working and reworking in our minds and then with our hands on paper maybe initially and then on canvas but I think it's, it's a development that's very much akin to um, how babies and children see the world. Initially, they're looking at the mother's face. They're looking at a mirror and discovering their own face and features, those who are around them. And it becomes something um, that they use as, um, as a guidepost through the world, where everything else is measured against it and, and, oh. and is in some ways either close or apart and then brings them away or then they bring it back together. So I think that um, there's a constant um, assessment and evaluation of what we're seeing and what we're um, responding to and how we respond and all of that informs the kind of, um, in, my sense, in my case, figuration and the way in which figures are represented. Um, a lot has to do with you know, where I grew up and where I lived. And where, how would that influence <laughs> you? I mean, do you think you were seeing this way as I look out at any of these canvases, really? Were you seeing uh, people in this very angular way? Uh, and did every, every person you see have that kind of distinct quality about them that each of your figures in, a, in any given canvas here, I mean, there are no throwaways really you know there's no one who just sort of fade into a sort of obscure sort of boring ordinary lines <laughs> so was that how you saw things um, or well, see things um, 
I'm not going to go back before age three. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm amazed you saw that at all but, in but, age three. But certainly, you know, age three and four and five, six, seven. Um, I was in Southern California. I was in Los Angeles. And mm -hmm. so I had very strong light. Mm -hmm. I had the kinds of experiences of bodies that were visible mm -hmm. because everybody is in and out of swimming pools and playing yeah. in up and down the streets intense light and that creates um, uh, uh, how we see in, in intense light creates a very different visual phenomenon mm. so it eliminates a lot of detail it flattens things out it gives you high contrast you have both highly saturated color and then you also have the phenomenon that just the way darkness blinds you and eliminates your sight strong sun does the same as well and mm -hmm. eliminates a lot also mm -hmm. and, and yeah. so those were very early um, aspects of the work and and how it looked and then i had a huge shift when i was eight years old and moved to austria with my family and oh. we lived in a small town and we also traveled a lot but the environment was much more um i would say medieval so mm -hmm. that the architecture was different, yeah. the, uh, the, the painted buildings, um, the churches, the idea that and when you walk down the main street every few blocks there was a, a street altar with a carved crucifixion that was painted with crowns of thorns yeah, and yeah. the blood coming down from um, the, the crucified um, Christ. So all of those things had a very strong impact as an eight-year-old to suddenly be confronted with these things. And the fact that from our school, we made a weekly walk to church and the church had large cast bronze, were bronze figures that were medieval, um, a lot of armored um, figures and, mm. and very dark, ironwork everywhere so then you have that angularity coming in um, mm. and, and whether that's what I was seeing you know in in my home environment or not it certainly was in the in the cultural environment that surrounded me at yeah. that time were you actually drawing and <laughs> painting and, and even as, as a very small child yes so you just sort of took to it as as uh, something you just love to do I, you know, I, I remember painting in kindergarten and really loving it and mm -hmm. um, being interested, you know, like, like when you're, when you're painting yourself or your family, like, what does it really look like and what color is this and what is that? But when I was in Austria, um, as you might imagine, I was so different and did not have friends or, you know, any yeah. kind of companionship. So. For those those years, I would in fact come home, do my homework, and then I would sit and draw or paint. So mm -hmm. I had watercolors, I had you know, pencils, yeah. I had pastels, and I, I did that every day because there was no one to play with. <laughs> uh -huh. So in, in, in effect, the isolation was very fortunate in regard to your being you know, really connected to your art and to what became a serious work of your life. Sure. I, I'm sure that there are many artists through history you could point to who were happy and well-adjusted and had everything and um, friends and, and, but I think it's probably, and, and that my, I might have been an artist even had I, you know, had mm -hmm. that kind of um, yeah. childhood. Yeah. But I think that certainly um, the idea of, of amusing ourselves and spending time by ourselves, long hours, uh, feeds into the the life that is required of making art mm -hmm. and and so they they feed into each other and probably children who um, get that kind of intense pleasure gravitate toward writing poetry or um, or or drawing or painting um, develop a fantasy life for themselves um, yeah. And, and who knows which informs the other more strongly, but they certainly feed off of each other. Yeah. Then when would you say you actually thought of yourself as an artist? I mean, it, it, it's one thing to be drawing and painting as a child and, and loving it, and, and clearly it's a natural aptitude, and 
you know, it, it, I always say to parents, you should look at your children and see what they love to do, and then kind of try to build on that instead of forcing, you know, a, 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 some particular um, interest or activity. But um, when would you say you began to more self-consciously think of yourself as someone who made art, who you may not have thought of yourself as an artist exactly, but how did that evolve from just drawing and painting all the time to actually being becoming what you would say call an artist to the world or describe as an artist to the world? Well, I think actually it starts very early. Yeah. Maybe not everyone you know talks about it in those terms, but certainly at age 12, 13, you know, 14, we're, um, where our, our self-identity, our identity is so central to all our waking hours, I think, yeah. so that um, we're deciding who we are and we're taken up with literary figures, we're taken up with, uh, with people in music or uh, dance, if we're interested in dance, and we start looking for something and we see ourselves and relate in the sense that we develop a dialogue not only with our parents or with our peers, but with these figures who really loom in our lives as if they were just as real, so that we're pretty much surrounded by all these people that we admire and that we think about and, and find a connection to. So probably, um, you know, right in there, 12, 13, 14, if this is something that you do every day, as I was doing every day, um, this becomes your identity, just as other kids might say, oh, you know, I'm good at um, soccer, or I'm good at yeah. basketball, yeah. or I'm really good at um, dance. There are others who are drawing all the time, and that becomes how they're interfacing with their peers. That's where they mm -hmm. get their acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And when you are um, taking art classes in school, you become part of a small group, and yeah. you have that association. Yeah. Uh, um, and if you're really fortunate, then you get a lot of feedback from, you know, your your friends, your teachers, your family. Yeah. And then what happens, um, for the most part, is that you follow that path because it's very rewarding. That's mm -hmm. where you're getting recognition, and yeah. uh, it it gives you as much as you're giving to it. Yeah, and of course, it's what you've been doing for so long that. It's, uh, it's really in deeply internalized, deeply. And then when, when did you decide, well, this is going to be my life's work? I'm, I, you know, I mean, that, a lot of people, I think in this society in particular, where the pressures to do something practical so you can earn a living and so forth are so intense. So when did you decide, well, I'm going to be an artist and I'm going to, um, I'm going to commit my life to to painting or you know the visual arts and call yourself an artist and sort of you know say this is it this is what I'm yeah. going to be come hell or high water <laughs> well um, I think when I was about 12 uh, <laughs> you know, very early I, I was looking at two options you know I was looking at um, and, and I don't think in terms of of um, of a career or support, but in terms of uh, myself, and I, I loved writing poetry when I was 12 mm -hmm. and, and making art, and I think it became clear to me when I looked at the two that, you know, I wasn't going to be a poet, mm -hmm. that that just was not there, and that this is what I was going to do. And certainly by the time I was 14, 15, I had um, already geared 15 high school. My education was geared toward the art, and I had left oh. everything else behind. Uh -huh. So I pretty much became a very narrow living was that individual already by the time I was 15. 15. 14, was that in this country, or were you? That still was here. I was, was, I, was I was back, back. in Europe. Yeah, I was. Back. And so, and that was in Los Angeles. So. Then.